the Joe Rogan experience. Is this particularly offensive to you because, I mean, it must be because of your background. And I, you briefly talked about that, but for people who don't know you, I, I would like you to explain your upbringing, where you came from, and how you had to literally risk your life to escape that. So I was born in Somalia in 1969, and growing up in the 70s, my family went to Saudi Arabia, we went to Ethiopia, we went to Kenya, that's where I learned English. And then finally, in 1992, I ended up in the Netherlands. Uh, but if you ask me in the context of science to tell you about those years between, you know, when I could walk and talk and understand what was going around me until about 1992 when I left, uh, I come from territories where superstition is it's the thing to do, you know. Um, my father left us in 1982. Uh, he left us in Kenya. He went back to Ethiopia to fight uh, for what he felt was uh, his calling, uh, democracy and a just system for the Somali people. But in Kenya, my mother, who was with my grandmother, her mother's mother, they felt abandoned in a strange country and they didn't understand what was going on and they had the three of us. The three of us, that is my older brother and my younger sister. And as children go, we were terrible. And I remember my mother going off to see witch doctors and ask them, how, 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 do, I, how do I deal with my daily life? And those witch doctors would want one thing, which was whatever money she could give them. And if she couldn't give money, then it would be her goat, or it would be something that they treasured. And in Kenya, I'm 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, and all the time when she goes to these people, all I want to say to her is, this is superstition. You're wasting your money. You're wasting your time leave them alone. My mother couldn't read or write, so I didn't know a way of expressing that. And then soon after, in 1985, I was 15 years old when members of the Muslim Brotherhood came along. And they finally convinced my mother and grandmother and all the women in our neighborhoods, do not reach out to the, the superstitious. Don't go to the witch doctors. Come to God, the one and only read the Quran. They can't read the Quran, so they have to trust in what he tells them. The Hadith, Muhammad's way of doing things. And in a way, I felt, I felt grateful to the people who had shepherded the women of, the grown-up women of my life, away from these superstitious people to the one and true and only God. It just happened to be another superstition, better organized, more slick. But at the time, you didn't think so? At the time, I didn't think so. Of course, at the time, I completely believed in it. Why did you, uh, why did you know that the witch doctors were just superstitious and that it was nonsense? At so, such an early age. I'm in fourth grade. I had the fortune to actually go to school and be taught such things as science, so the science class, biology, cause and effect, the way things happen. One of the things that ravaged us was malaria. I got malaria. Everybody I know got malaria. Most people uh, had families where people died. People got sick, really very sick, and then died. And the witch doctors were supposed to make these people well, and they were uh, at any rate supposed to stop them from dying. So going to the biology class, when we were told uh, they, they literally to look at an insect called a mosquito and dissect it and look at its behavior and how it seeks still water, lays its eggs, and what happens when that mosquito comes and uh, injects its, what do you call it, that little um, 
piece of itself into you, draws your blood and leaves something in you, which is the parasite. Once you understand that, and this is, I'm in fourth grade, fifth grade, once they teach that and they show how it works, you go home and you say, don't give any more money to the witch doctor. Actually, what we should do is go around to all the little puddles and pools of water around us. Let's drain those, dry those, keep our windows shut. Um, we had this big can of pesticide called doom. And I would say, let's spray those after we had done all of that. And we wouldn't have malaria because that's how it is. So I found myself, even at that age, confronting grown-ups who were established, who were well-respected, and who were taking money from my poor mother because they would cure malaria. And I come in, I mean, with the most superficial level of education you can think, but objective education to say, I actually get what's happening. And that, I, I can't explain to an American audience the confrontation, the just the boundaries that you're crossing and, and the people you're making angry, the toes you're stepping on. When you, you know, you breeze into the house and say, and now I know how it works. Mm. So you, as a, as a, a young woman, were going to be forced into an arranged marriage. And this is what made you flee and, and head to Europe and, and wind up in Holland, correct? That's correct, yeah. Can you, can you explain how that, that was going down? So this is 1992, and by then I'm 22 years old. So we've been in Kenya from 1980 to, in my case, 1992. My father left us in 1982 and I was about 12 years old. And all this time he was gone, he was gone for 10 years. And he comes back and he says, it's time for you to get married. You hadn't seen him in 10 years? I hadn't seen him in 10 years. Had you communicated with him at all? He, he used to write letters and after a while the letters stopped. Uh, but the point in terms of these, him taking the duty upon himself, it's his duty. So. The way it works in Somali culture in uh, many parts of the world, that culture is the father's responsible for who, you, he's your guardian, he's your male guardian, he's responsible for who he's going to pass you on to, uh, that's finding you the right husband. But because he was gone from 82 to 1992, A, I was able to get on with age and get stronger and wiser, but also see some of my classmates and my friends who were forced into these arranged marriages. And my takeaway from looking at their lives was, I don't want my life to unfold that way because it was really a replication of my own mother's life. And my mother's life was miserable. Um, every country we went to, my mom didn't speak the language. She didn't want to learn the language, but she felt betrayed. She felt out of depth. She was angry, she was full of resentment, and she took it all out on us. So watching what was happening to these young women, I thought, surely life must offer more than that. And I, to this day, say I am grateful that my father left us when he did and came back when he did. Because had he been with us earlier, he might have taken this initiative to force me into marriage at the age of 15, 16, 17. And at that age, I'm not sure I would have accomplished what I did at 22. Mm. And when he was gone, I missed him and I was miserable. I wanted him to come back and be with us. But then again, Everything is about hindsight. In hindsight, I think, what if he had married me off at 15 or 16 or 17 or 18? Uh, you know, what kind of future would I have had? The environment that you lived in, you felt like women were second-class citizens and you felt like they were the property of men and they were at the beck and call of men and they were 
they weren't allowed to speak up. They weren't allowed to do many things that men were allowed to do. And they had to know their place. Yes. How frustrating was that? It was hugely frustrating. Um, also, I, I'm not trying to defend where I come from, but uh, Joe, when I listen to you talk like that, what I want to say is I know you've got an American Western um, attitude, so you're observing them through that prism, through the lens of, oh, these women are oppressed, uh, they aren't allowed to do anything. A and it's it's objectively true. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And there's so many women in that in those positions who agree with you. But being on the inside, being raised within that culture, when you complain about the absolute obedience that you have to show to your father and other male relatives, um, when you talk, when you object to the fact that you're not supposed to have a will of your own or desires of your own or things you want to do, the put down was always that you are the rebel. Mm. You're sinning. Uh, you are you're breaking the rules and the laws and the norms and the customs. So you are wrong. And there would be conversations between my mother and her relatives on how can we bring her back into the straight path, if you will. Uh, the religious edicts, the tribal and clan edicts. And that's where things, when things get out of hand, because from one day, you are the insider. They try to mold you into the insider's beliefs and norms. You fail to do that. And if you're not careful, you'll be made the outsider. Were you unique amongst your friends and the people in your family, in your beliefs, that this was wrong? No, I was not alone. Uh, there were girls and women around me whom I, li I, I really consider them to be so much smarter, stronger, uh, more informed, in many ways wiser who I would look up to. They might be two or three years older than me, and I would say, well, I'm really having a hard time right now with my mother and sticking to the rules. How do you do it? How have you done it? And the answers I would get most often would be, you're young, you will learn. There's no way out of here. So what you need to do is show willpower, show strength show commitment everybody goes through this for some it will be harder than others but the constant the thing i was told constantly is it's as hard as you make it in other words the sooner you submit the sooner all these hardships go away and then you're just one of us and you're doing what you're supposed to do what you were created to do by god you're taking your place the more you say I'm not going to do this. I'm going to read this novel. It's not my turn to do the dishes. It's someone else's turn. You start fantasizing about where you think you could be. Then you are stepping on so many toys at that point. And you know there's nobody who's going to be on your side. So you can make the pain as long as you want it to be. Catch new episodes of the Joe Rogan Experience for free only on Spotify. Watch back catalog JRE videos on Spotify, including clips. Easily, seamlessly switch between video and audio experience. On Spotify, you can listen to the JRE in the background while using other apps and can download episodes to save on data cost all for free. Spotify is absolutely free. You don't have to have a premium account to watch new JRE episodes. You just need to search for the JRE on your Spotify app. Go to Spotify now to get this full episode of the Joe Rogan Experience.